Merci Peter. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour les amis. Uh, what a pleasure to be here today. This is uh, a nice moment for us to uh, celebrate a one year anniversary of uh, forming government. Uh, but also a time to reflect uh, on uh, what we've done so far and how we're continuing to work for the future. And for me, whenever I think about how we're working for the future, what we're thinking about uh, in the months and the years and beyond coming up, uh, it's really important uh, to connect that and to be reminded uh, of the long term uh, by connecting with all of you. So having young people here today uh, to ask questions, to uh, talk about where we're going as a government and where we've been, uh, is for me one of those, those really, really uh, key ways of staying connected with what matters for uh, today, for tomorrow, and for the long-term future of this country. So uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here uh, because this is uh, not just important to sort of mark uh, this anniversary, but it's an important moment uh, for me and for all of us uh, to hear from you, to hear the things that you and your peers are worried about, uh, to respond to some of those questions, and to involve you in how we are shaping uh, the future of this country all together. But as you know, it's not something that we do all alone. We have chosen to work in a team. Uh, on, choisit, on a choisi de faire un gouvernement uh, par cabinet, uh, mais pour avoir un cabinet uh, à la hauteur uh, des attentes des Canadiens, il a fallu choisir une équipe uh, qui reflète la réalité et la diversité du Canada. Et c'est exactement ce qu'on a pu faire ici avec une équipe extraordinaire uh, qui a, a énormément de diversité à l'intérieur de cette équipe. Et, et, il faut que vous compreniez que ce n'est pas juste une question de euh, vouloir euh, s'assurer que tous les Canadiens peuvent euh, voir des gens qui euh, reflètent leur identité ou qui, euh, qui pourraient comprendre euh, les défis ou les, 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 non, les défis euh, qu'on qu pourrait vivre à, la, à, à travers le pays. Mais c'est aussi important d'avoir une diversité de perspectives. One of the amazing things that we have uh, with uh, a group as diverse as this cabinet is, even though, like Canadians ourselves, we're bound together on a broad range of values and principles that we all agree on, we come at it from very different places, from very different stories, from uh, different linguistic, religious, uh, cultural, geographic backgrounds. And having a group of people with a broad range of perspectives work together on a project that unites us all, that is serving this country, uh, allows for an extraordinarily beneficial level of uh, complex discussions and perspectives. We get better outcomes when we are highlighting gender balance, when we're highlighting uh, the broad range of uh, diverse perspectives and backgrounds that are there. So uh, for me, this is the kind of cabinet we need if we're going to be able uh, to fold in all the various perspectives, but all the various solutions uh, that Canadians themselves uh, expect to see from their government. But one of the other things is, uh, it's not just about uh, picking a great group of people. It's about actually empowering them to be decision makers. Now, any one person doesn't have all the answers and can't know everything, no matter how, hard, how smart they are or think they are. Uh, but together, but together, we can. Making sure that we're able to fold in and give responsibilities uh, to uh, ministers who actually have decision-making powers, who actually choose and shape and are responsible for the decisions. So these ministers are not spokespeople for their departments or for what the Prime Minister wants them to say. They are very much uh, driving the agenda, driving the solutions, responsible uh, for uh, the decisions they're making. And quite frankly, that's pretty much the question that each and every one of them asked me uh, well, when I was encouraging them to step forward into government. Uh, they wanted to know that they would be able to actually take responsibility and drive and impact change themselves. 
And quite frankly, as a country, uh, we're amazingly lucky uh, that these people are doing just that because the breadth of strength and decision making that they have uh, shown over the past year uh, makes all of us looks good, makes me look good, uh, and quite frankly, sets this country on the right path. So uh, I want to take a few moments right now to, to uh, introduce to you uh, our cabinet, these uh, great folks, and then I'm looking forward to getting, uh, getting around to some of your questions uh, afterwards. Uh, but I think it's important to understand um, the, the depth and the strengths uh, of the folks behind us in this room. Now, not every cabinet minister could be with us here today, so I just want to shout out to uh, uh, a few of the, uh, the folks who weren't be able to be here. Uh, Jody Wilson-Raybolt is our Attorney General Minister of Justice, and she's in Australia right now, speaking about uh, a really important issue both to us and to Australia, which is reconciliation uh, with Indigenous populations. Uh, Marc Garneau, uh, our Transport Minister, right now uh, is in Montreal to share a vision uh, for what transportation could and should look like uh, in 2030. And our Minister of Sport and Persons with Disabilities is in Vancouver, talking of thousands of kids just like you guys uh, for We Day. Uh, Bill Morneau, our Minister of Finance, is out talking about the fall economic statement we just released and how it'll help families uh, like yours have a brighter, more secure future. Uh, and there are six other uh, fantastic ministers who couldn't be here today because they're out working hard to deliver on the things that Canadians elected us to do. Uh, that said, uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, 19 of our ministers here with us, and I'd like to, you, to introduce, them, introduce them to you now. Now, what I'm going to ask each one of them uh, as we go through uh, is uh, to tell us either what their favorite moment, the thing they're most proud of from the past year is, or else uh, what uh, they're looking forward to, what you guys should keep an eye out for in the coming year uh, that they're going to be doing that I, they think is going to make a particular, uh, a particular impact. Alors, uh, je suis très content de, de vous présenter maintenant notre cabinet uh, et parce que je suis ancien enseignant, uh, je vais le faire par ordre alphabétique. Uh, parce que je suis enseignant et parce que c'est comme ça que mes fiches sont placées. Merci. Alors, uh, d'abord, je commence avec Marie-Claude Bibot. Euh, Marie-Claude avait vu au Maroc et au Bénin lorsqu'elle travaillait pour l'ancien bureau du développement international du Canada. C'est ce qui fait d'elle un choix formidable pour le poste du développement international et de la fran francophonie. Euh, cette année, elle a contribué à l'organisation de la conférence euh, de reconstitution des ressources du Fonds mondial, l'affaire avec Bono et Bill Gates qu'on a faite à Montréal il y a quelques semaines. Euh, on, on a réuni euh, euh, plusieurs amis, on a pu collecter euh, presque 13 milliards de dollars pour contrer le paludisme, la tuberculose euh, et le sida et pour en finir pour du bon en 2030 euh, et euh, Marie-Claude a été au cœur de ça et euh, je suis très très content de, de te voir ici Marie-Claude. Euh, Parle-nous de, 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 de tes highlights ou de ce qui s'en vient. Alors merci. Alors moi je suis ministre du Développement international et de la francophonie et le mandat que le premier ministre m'a confié c'est de revoir toute la politique d'aide internationale. Alors c'est vraiment un privilège pour moi de faire ça parce que de revoir une politique en profondeur comme on le fait actuellement, on fait ça à tous les 10, peut-être 15 ans. Alors c'est vraiment un privilège. Et pendant toute l'année on fait une grande consultation avec les Canadiens, avec nos partenaires à l'étranger et vraiment la décision unanime qui a été prise c'est qu'on va mettre les femmes et les filles au cœur de nos priorités. D'une part, parce que dans ces pays-là, elles sont souvent les plus vulnérables face à la pauvreté et à la violence, entre autres, et même au changement climatique, mais aussi parce qu'on sait qu'elles sont d'extraordinaires moteurs de changement, de développement et de paix. Merci beaucoup, Marie-Claude. Et merci beaucoup d'avoir été brève. Comme, comme je vais faire au cabinet, si vous parlez trop longtemps, je, je vais vous couper. Euh, Next person I'd love to uh, hear from is Bardish Chagger. Now, uh, Bardish is not only our Minister of Small Business and Tourism, she's also the leader of the government in the House of Commons, uh, the first woman in Canadian history uh, to hold that position. As House Leader, she's responsible for managing the government's day-to-day -day in the House, which means that when we are in the House, technically, she's my boss. And she reminds me of that as we sit together all the time. So, uh, Bardish, uh, tell us. Thank you, Prime Minister. Welcome, everyone. It is indeed an honor and privilege to be amongst yourselves. I have to say the thing that I'm most proud of is that 
our government has been able to bring people of all walks of life together. So I got involved in the political process when I was 13 years old. I didn't have a vote, but I did have a say. And it is so important that you be involved in shaping the kind of country that you want to live in. And that's why I'm so happy to be here, serving Canadians each and every single day. Something I'm looking forward to is the women's entrepreneurship strategy to get more women, more young people, more underrepresented groups, representing small business owners, creating the job opportunities of the future, and also the tourism vision, because our country is amazing. Everyone needs to visit, and I challenge each and every single one of you to visit 10 provinces, three great territories, and to experience everything that Canada has to offer. Thank you so much. Outstanding British. Merci. Next, j'aimerais passer à notre ministre uh, d'Affaires étrangères, Stéphane Dion. Uh, Une de, mes, une de mes anecdotes préférées pour Stéphane, c'est quand il était jeune et encore en train d'apprendre l'anglais, quand il rencontrait euh, des touristes, euh, il, il lui demandait des directions. Euh, lui, sa, sa réponse, c'est toujours euh, « aller tout droit ». You just go straight ahead. Euh, N'importe quoi. Et je pense que c'est un, un métaphore pour la façon que Stéphane a toujours euh, foncé dans la vie. Mais évidemment, euh, Stéphane a un très bon sens de l'orientation et combiné avec ses années d'expérience en politique, il fait un formidable ministre des Affaires étrangères où il contribue à rétablir une présence solide du Canada à travers le monde. Euh, merci Stéphane de faire partie de nous. Merci de partager ce matin. Oui, Monsieur le Premier ministre, je voudrais raconter le pire, pire événement que j'ai vécu durant la dernière année comme ministre des Affaires étrangères et le plus bel événement. So the worst one, it was when I was in Sri Lanka uh, a country that had an awful civil war, and, and the mother uh, f um, brought herself on, on her knees facing me and asking me desperately uh, to bring her son back. Her son disappeared during the war. And I tried to lift her up, and she came back on her, her knees again. It was awful for me, and I thought in my mind, I cannot bring her son back. But we need to do everything we can under the leadership of the Prime Minister to help countries like Sri Lanka to get out of civil war and to have a future and to have reconciliation altogether. Le, le meilleur moment, c'est quand j'étais au Guatemala et j'ai rencontré une jeune fille de votre âge qui s'appelle Nancy et qui a décidé de prendre le leadership pour que dans son pays, il n'y ait plus de mariage forcé. Et avec l'aide du Canada et d'autres pays, elle a fait une campagne si efficace qu'elle a obtenu que le Guatemala est comme loi, que les garçons et les filles ne se marient pas avant l'âge de 18 ans. Et elle veut faire ça ailleurs pour d'autres pays. C'est ce que veut faire Marie-Claude Bibot. C'est ce qu'on veut tous faire. Donc le Canada a un rôle à jouer dans le monde. We have a role to play in the world and we must be very proud of it and to do it with a lack of determination. Canada must be a determined peace builder, un architecte résolu de la paix. Merci. Merci Stéphane. Alors, next, je vais vous présenter Jean-Yves Duclos. Euh, avant de devenir ministre de la Famille, des Enfants et du Développement social, il était directeur du département d'économie de l'Université Laval. Et avant ça, il a été employé du mois chez McDonald's. Alors, euh, euh, on, 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 on sait où, où tout ça peut mener. Euh, Jean-Yves est chargé de gérer beaucoup de choses qui touchent directement vos familles. Par exemple, c'est lui qui a mis sur pied la nouvelle allocation canadienne pour enfants qui a été lancé cet été. Grâce à cette allocation, neuf familles sur dix ont plus d'argent chaque mois pour aider à assumer les coûts nécessaires pour élever les enfants. Et euh, cette allocation va sortir des centaines de milliers de jeunes de la pauvreté à travers le pays. On en est très fiers. Jean-Yves. Merci, Justin. Alors, comme Justin, j'ai été professeur durant quelques années. Mon père m'a toujours dit que pour euh, s'il y a quelque chose qu'on ne sait pas faire, la meilleure façon de l'apprendre, c'est de l'enseigner. Alors, j'ai fait durant 25 ans, et après 25 ans, j'ai commencé à dire que, bon, j'ai commencé à connaître assez bien mon domaine. Mais ce qui m'unit à vous aujourd'hui, c'est la question des devoirs. Moi aussi, je suis très nerveux quand je reçois des devoirs. Euh, je regarde, un, qu'est-ce qu'il y a à faire, puis je, me, je regarde, deux, comment, à, que, à quel moment je, je, je dois le faire. Et ce qui m'a rendu le plus nerveux, mais aussi le plus fier au cours des derniers mois, c'est quand M. Trudeau m'a rencontré en décembre dernier. Il m'a dit, Jean-Yves, il y a la location canadienne pour enfants que tu dois faire, 25 milliards de dollars. Et tu dois le faire pour le mois de juillet. Et ça doit sortir 40 % des enfants du pays en dehors de la pauvreté. Alors, avec le travail d'équipe que nous avons fait ensemble, nous avons réussi à faire ça. Et j'en suis évidemment très fier. Merci. Merci, Jean-Yves.
Next, I'd like to turn uh, to our cabinet minister who hails from uh, the Buren Peninsula in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, Judy Foote, who's the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, which means she's responsible for managing all the contracts the government needs to actually run, from defense to Canada Post and the building, uh, to the buildings that our government staff work in every day. And if that wasn't enough, Judy also has the difficult challenge of having to sit next to the biggest geek in the House of Commons. That'd be me. <laughs> Go ahead, Judy. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, first of all, let me say how exciting it is to be here with all of you. When I walked into the room, I thought, here are the leaders of today, not just the leaders of tomorrow. So whenever I get an opportunity to do this, I do it. And I encourage all of you to really consider getting involved in the political process, getting involved in politics as a career, or in our incredible, incredible public service, because there are wonderful opportunities there for each and every one of you. Public services and procurement, as the Prime Minister said, is a large department of government, and it's an operational department. Uh, we work with all of departments in government, and uh, that's what's really exciting for me, is that we get to have an impact working with all of my colleagues here on the stage and those who couldn't be with us today. And one of the um, things that I'm really proud of that we have done, and we've done a lot that we're very pleased about, but it would be working with uh, the Minister of Immigration, with uh, the Honourable John McCollum, uh, in terms of the bringing the Syrian refugees here to Canada. And you know how hard we worked and how hard John worked to do that. We all did as a cabinet, and thank you to the Prime Minister for uh, making that possible. But what was really exciting for me was when I saw the Prime Minister welcoming Syrian refugees at the airport, it was knowing that the department that I lead was really responsible for getting them here in terms of arranging their flights, making sure they had winter jackets, making sure they had places to stay. Those are the types of things that public services and procurement is involved in, in addition to all of the other challenges that the Prime Minister mentioned. So it's so good to see all of you here. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us who get to serve in Cabinet. And uh, that could be your future if you consider politics as a career. Thank you. Thank you. The next member of Cabinet I'd like to introduce is Christia Freeland. She's our Minister of International Trade, who's had a very busy past few weeks. Uh, not that that's unusual, but she was making sure over the past uh, a few weeks that we actually uh, concluded a really important trade agreement, the uh, Canada-Europe uh, uh, trade agreement uh, known as CETA, the Comprehensive Economic uh, uh, Trade Agreement, uh, that uh, is going to make a huge difference for Canadians in terms of having uh, access to European markets for our producers and uh, you know, lowering trade uh, barriers and op creating opportunities for everyone. One of the interesting things is uh, one of the ways she got it done was by backyard diplomacy. And if you don't know what backyard diplomacy is, uh, Christia can tell you, uh, she invited important diplomats over to her backyard for a barbecue and talked about how uh, they were going to work things out uh, in a very uh, connected, real and human way. And uh, that uh, leadership that she showed, that drive and the strength of, of personality and uh, intellect uh, that has uh, guided us uh, through this trade deal every step of the way uh, really is what uh, allowed us to be celebrating uh, an incredible achievement this past week. So Christia, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you very much, Prime Minister, and that story is actually true. Um, I am a mother. I have a 15-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and when I told them we were having these Europeans come over for a barbecue, they said, can we go to our rooms? And I said, no, actually, you have to barbecue and be charming. Um, so feel sorry for them, please. Um, look, I thought about what I was the proudest of. And what I'm the proudest of this year is to have served in Canada's first gender-balanced cabinet. I thought it was a great idea when the Prime Minister put it in our election program, but I didn't appreciate the power it would have until he did it. Um, I travel around the world a lot, and the thing that we've done that I hear from the most about is women in cabinet, and especially women in countries where women's rights are more in jeopardy than in Canada. Like the younger women in the delegations, they come up to me, they hug me, they say, because it's 2015, and that is so powerful. 
And as the mother of a young woman who's the age of a lot of you here, a 15-year-old, I see the impact that's had. So that's what's meant the most to me as a mother and a woman. Thank you, Christia. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Ralph Goodell. Uh, Ralph is the person we turn to uh, when things go wrong, uh, and he's the guy uh, who makes sure uh, that we're all kept safe. Uh, he also oversees, oversees the national security file, which includes Canada's intelligence service and spies. So that's uh, something I'm actually kind of jealous of that he gets to uh, gets to play in there. Uh, it's a, it's an important job because while he's driving uh, to make sure uh, that Canadians are kept safe, uh, he's also having to make sure every step of the way that we're respecting the law and the values and the things that are important to Canadians. Because we know we have to protect our rights and protect our safeties. At at the same time, and uh, Ralph does a very good job at it. He's also uh, the only caucus member to have served under two prime ministers named Trudeau. Uh, so thank you, Ralph, for being here. Prime Minister, thank you, uh, and it's a great privilege to uh, participate in this event today with all of my colleagues, but uh, most especially all of these fascinating young people who uh, are leaders today and, uh, and will be leaders tomorrow. Thank you for, uh, for being with us this morning. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's hard to pick out one or two things from this fascinating first year of uh, uh, the second Trudeau government, uh, but I, you know, one, of the, one of the things that really stands out for me is the emergency preparedness side of my portfolio and representing the government of Canada in dealing with that awful fire that affected Fort McMurray in northern Alberta in May of, of this year. 80,000 people had to be relocated. Uh, half a million hectares of land and forest and community were, uh, were burned out. Uh, it was the biggest natural fire disaster in Canadian history. And from my perspective, I got to see some fascinating things. The, the strength and resilience of the people of Fort McMurray, the raw courage that got them through that situation. The amazing first responders, firefighters, and, and all of the others who, uh, who came to the rescue. Uh, the real leadership and determination of the local officials and the provincial officials in, uh, uh, in Alberta. Uh, the, uh, the wonderful way that federal government agencies came together to help. Uh, and the amazing generosity of, of Canadians right across this country who said, in, in moral terms, but also in cold, hard cash, hey, Fort Mac, we've got your back, because that's what we do as Canadians. When there's trouble anywhere, we all pull together and rescue each other and defend each other and help each other to get through it. It was, uh, it was a tough moment in dealing with that awful fire. The beast, as everybody called it, uh, but it was a wonderful moment to see the, the heart and the strength and the courage of Canadians respond. It's a great highlight, a great dem demonstration of what Canada is all about. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, I'd like to pass uh, now on to uh, Minister Patty Haidu. Now, Patty uh, was actually the first uh, person in her family to complete post-secondary education, also the first member of her family to be a cabinet minister. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, back home in Thunder Bay, uh, Patty ran the city's largest homeless shelter and has dedicated her career uh, to working with marginalized communities. And I can tell you uh, that as Minister for the Status of Women, as uh, an advocate uh, for marginalized peoples and an extraordinarily strong voice around cabinet who keeps us on our toes uh, and thinking uh, about people who don't often have uh, their voices heard around cabinet table. Uh, she is an extraordinary uh, member of our team and I'm happy to also point out uh, that today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Patty. She turns 50 today. Bon fête, Patty. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister, for the birthday wishes. And really, it's my 50th birthday, and I'm here with all of you, so I couldn't ask for a better party. I would have to say that I am so proud of a government that recognizes that we are stronger because of our diversity and not in spite of it. And not just the diversity that we automatically think about in terms of religion or culture or gender even, but in fact the diversity that allows people like me, someone who grew up in poverty, 
raised by a single mother, who raised my two children alone to actually gain an education, contribute to my community, and now contribute to my country. And I am so proud to say that there is opportunity for all of you. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Prime Minister's leadership on gender equity, because I see a lot of young women in the audience today. And I can guarantee you that this is probably uh, something you will reflect back on seeing a cabinet that has just as many women as men, and seeing a place for yourself in government. And we're going to get more pictures of women on the walls of these buildings in this city. Thank you so much for your interest, and thanks for being here today. Thanks, Patty. I'd now like to introduce Kent Hare, who's our Minister of Veterans Affairs and the Associate Minister of National Defense. Uh, Kent's also a big hockey fan. He played in the Alberta Junior Hockey League for a number of years, and as part of his memorabilia collection, he has a hockey stick signed by Wayne Gretzky, which he won't let me touch. Um, <laughs> this year, he helped reopen two of the nine Veterans Affairs offices that were previously closed. These are the frontline offices that offer help to our veterans and are a really important part of keeping our promises to those who have served and uh, Kent and his department are on track to reopening uh, seven more offices by next May because those who uh, serve their country in the military deserve to make sure uh, that be to understand that we are taking care of them when they come home and their families. So Kent, tell us about well, thank you, Prime Minister. And 2.3 uh, million Canadians have served this nation in our armed forces. 118,000 of them have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And I think what I'm most proud of is our government understands not only recognizing their contributions, but understanding that uh, when they come back, they often have physical, emotional scars that uh, our department is trying to work with them to better their outcomes for them and their families full stop. And we, uh, we're looking at this in a whole of government approach. And, and my work, you don't just work with your department, you work with an entire team here. And my work with Minister Sejan on how we're gonna better outcomes for our men and women who serve in our military and how they're gonna have better uh, employment opportunities, better education opportunities, better access to uh, mental and physical supports where and when they need them is what I'm so proud of because you don't just do it in, in one department here in our government. We work all very closely together to make sure our, our partnerships and our linkages have better outcomes for our citizens of this great nation. And just working with each and every one of you on a day-to-day -day basis has truly been a joy and an honor and a privilege. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Kent. Je passe maintenant à Mélanie Joly, qui est la seule personne parmi nous aujourd'hui qui a véritablement fondé un parti politique, le vrai changement pour Montréal, lorsqu'elle a participé à la course à la mairie de Montréal en 2013. À titre du ministre de patrimoine, du patrimoine canadien, elle est chargée de faire en sorte que l'on reconnaisse notre identité canadienne unique et pour l'an prochain, elle a la formidable tâche de chapeauter toutes les célébrations du 150e anniversaire de la Confédération canadienne. Je m'attends à ce que chacun et chacune d'entre vous y participe. Ça va être une grosse fête l'année prochaine, 150 ans euh, depuis la Confédération. C'est Mélanie qui est en charge. Mélanie. Merci, M. le Premier ministre. Alors, euh, si je peux me permettre, je vais vous poser des questions. Who is right now on Facebook? Please raise your hand. Who has an Instagram account? Who has a Snapchat account? Who has a Twitter account, maybe? OK. That's great. Now, what my team and I are doing is making sure that every do thing we do at Heritage and all our laws and, and regulation take into account how you communicate. Et pour nous, c'est fondamental because everything that is done right now doesn't take into account your reality and our reality. So this is a big challenge I'm tackling. Et puis aussi, mais le premier ministre vous en a parlé. Pour nous, on va avoir un grand anniversaire l'an prochain. So who will be celebrating Canada 150? You better all raise your hands. <laughs> so um, j'espère que vous allez vraiment uh, faire en sorte de pouvoir célébrer because we're counting on you to be the generation 2017. Thank you. Uh, 
I now want to pass to uh, Dominic LeBlanc, uh, who's our Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. But uh, you have to understand, Dominic and I go way back. He used to babysit me uh, when, uh, when uh, I was a kid. Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if I'm a little squirrely from time to time, I blame it on, on him. Uh, mais avant que, uh, parce que nos, nos pères étaient amis, uh, mais avant que le père de Dominique devienne gouverneur général, Il était ministre des Pêches, des Océans et de la Garde côtière canadienne durant le mandat de mon père. Alors, pour moi, d'avoir pu euh, nommer Dominique euh, à ce, ce même ministère euh, a été euh, très touchant par, par rapport à, à, à notre histoire de famille. Euh, mais surtout, il fait une job extraordinaire, euh, entre autres, euh, d'avoir euh, rouvert, rouvert euh, la, garde côte, la base de garde côtière euh, de Kitsilano. Euh, à, à Vancouver parce que euh, c'est important d'être euh, prêt pour assurer la sécurité des Canadiens en milieu marine. Euh, et il faut se rappeler qu'en plus de nos lacs et de nos rivières, le Canada doit aussi gérer trois océans euh, de concert avec des partenaires provinciaux, territoriaux et autochtones. C'est un travail exigeant et je suis vraiment content de pouvoir euh, euh, compter sur euh, Dominique pour travailler très fort à cet égard. Dominique. Alors, merci, M. le Premier ministre. Euh, à y penser, M. le Premier ministre, quand vous et moi, on avait l'âge de nos invités ici, uh, we would be riding our bicycles around New Edinburgh, ringing doorbells and running away. Uh, what, a, what a difference 35 years can make. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of, and the Prime Minister mentioned it, is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, for me, should and can be a very, very big part of our government's environmental agenda. And the Prime Minister has asked me to work on protecting more of Canada's oceans, protecting oceans from obviously pollution, from overfishing, and ensuring that the fish and the marine mammals that live in our three oceans uh, will be there for generations and generations to come. So what I'm very excited about is our department has hired a hundred new scientists already this year to help us make the best decisions we can. I hope some of you may be interested in marine biology and come and work for us to help us protect Canada's oceans and make the best decisions we can for generations and generations to come on how to build a sustainable economy in parts of the country that are very dear to me. I come from New Brunswick on the East Coast, so you can imagine how excited I am when the Prime Minister gave me this job. Merci beaucoup. J'aimerais maintenant vous présenter Diane Le Boutillier. Euh, vous savez, la première fois que j'ai parlé à Diane, euh, quand elle était candidate, euh, elle était en auto euh, et j'ai passé les premiers trois, quatre minutes à essayer de lui convaincre pour de vrai que c'était moi qui appelais. Là. Elle ne me croyait pas, euh, mais euh, je suis très, très content qu'elle a fait une campagne extraordinaire, qu'elle est euh, devenue euh, députée euh, et surtout euh, notre ministre du Revenu national. Euh, elle est chargée de recueillir l'argent des impôts que nous pouvons ensuite réinvestir en tant que gouvernement. C'est un rôle clé au sein du cabinet et je suis très heureux qu'elle réponde encore à mes appels, euh, mais euh, surtout après un, un, un département si mouvementé. Euh, C'est euh, vraiment, vraiment quelqu'un d'extraordinaire qu'on est très, très content d'avoir parmi nous au sein du cabinet. Diane. Bonjour tout le monde. Écoutez, je suis très fière d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Euh, ça a été euh, une année euh, qui a été extraordinaire et effectivement, euh, pour ceux qui me connaissent moins, je viens de la Gaspésie et des îles de la Madeleine. Gaspé en Micmac signifie le bout du monde. C'est pour vous dire là combien je viens de loin. Et d'avoir été nommé ministre au cabinet a fait en sorte aussi que tous les gens de la Gaspésie et des îles de la Madeleine sont excessivement fiers. Et ça nous fait dire aussi que tout est possible. Donc, euh, comme le premier ministre l'a dit, nous, euh, moi, au ministère du Revenu, c'est vraiment parce que j'ai un contact avec euh, tous vos parents une fois par année où euh, on va euh, récolter, euh, ramasser les impôts pour pouvoir ensuite remettre à la population euh, des, pour pouvoir avoir des services en éducation, des services en santé, des services en infrastructure, faire de la recherche et du développement et faire en sorte, recevoir les, les réfugiés, travailler avec les communautés, les communautés autochtones, puis faire en sorte que le Canada va être toujours le, c'est pas du bon français là, mais va être le plus 
beau meilleur pays du monde. <rire> Merci. Merci, Diane. Je passe maintenant la parole à John McCallum. John is our Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, and to say that he's had a busy year is something of an understatement. Uh, thanks to his hard work, in our first year, we were able to welcome more than 30,000 uh, refugees fleeing, fleeing the ongoing conflict in Syria. And here's a little known fact. Most people know John because of his years of political services or his time uh, spent in the private sector as a, a chief economist for one of Canada's biggest banks. Um, I know him uh, because he was my dean of arts when I was uh, a student at McGill. So. John. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. And as you once said, the fact that you never met me when I was in that capacity may have been a good sign. But I'm glad to have got to know you since then. As you have suggested, as others have suggested, certainly the best moment for me over the last year was that over the space of four months, we managed to bring 25,000 Syrian refugees from a terrible civil war across the country, across the ocean, to welcome them here in Canada. So I think that was a great achievement. Canadians were so welcoming, and that has made me very proud. If I look to the future, I'll name the many things we want to do. We want to make it a lot easier for international students to become Canadians. But the most important thing for me is that when we came to office, it took typically two years for a family to reunite itself. Some of you may know that if you've come from overseas. I think it is unacceptable that the heavy hand of the Canadian state would keep families apart for such a long time. So what I am really looking forward to in the not too distant future is that we can reduce that processing time very substantially and otherwise equip our department to grow this nation going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Next is Catherine McKenna. She's a local MP. She represents the riding of Ottawa Centre, and you might well recognize her from your own front door because she knocked on over 100,000 doors uh, in the last campaign uh, when she was a candidate. But she's now Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and she really does ride her bike to work. Uh, she's responsible for making sure that the climate plan we're putting together this fall with the provinces and territories will ensure that you have clean air and water through your whole lives and good jobs uh, that come with a, a, a smart, forward-thinking uh, economy uh, that we know uh, we need. So, Catherine. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Uh, J'ai le grand honneur d'être ministre de l'Environnement et des Changements Climatiques. It's a huge honor uh, to have this job because I have three kids. Uh, they're 7, 10, and 12, and the biggest challenge of our generation is tackling climate change. Uh, my greatest honor was going with the Prime Minister uh, to Paris for the COP21 negotiations. But we didn't just go, it wasn't just the Prime Minister and myself. We went with premiers. We went with uh, mayors. We met with indigenous leaders. We went with members of the opposition. We met with environmentalists. And we went with youth. And that's so important. Uh, and when we were there, we said, Canada knows climate change is real. And Canada is here to work together with the world to find solutions. And that made such a difference. Uh, and we worked extremely hard. And it was my huge honor uh, when the gavel went down and we achieved this ambitious agreement with 194 other countries. Now, I'm going to ask you one thing. I, I do pinky promises uh, with, with kids who are younger than you. Uh, the pinky promise uh, is that you will work with me to help tackle climate change. So I'm not going to make you do a pinky promise. You're a little too cool for that. Uh, but I will ask that you think about what you can do, what we can do together to tackle the biggest challenge of our generation, climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'd li like now to turn it to Miriam Monsef. Miriam is the Minister of Democratic Institutions and is, in fact, the youngest member of our cabinet. She turns 32 on Monday. Uh, it's 
actually worth noting because one of the things uh, that she's hard at work at figuring out is how to get more young people engaged in politics, how to get more young people involved and voting. Uh, it's important uh, not just to get everyone's voices heard, uh, but because the more young people get involved in politics, uh, the more politicians uh, need to respond to the long-term issues uh, that are always uh, forefront of your mind, as well as dealing with uh, immediate support for young people so you can uh, be uh, realizing your potential throughout your life. So, Mariam. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. It's a great privilege to be here with all of you on this traditional Algonquin territory. How many of you have a mentor? Someone you look up to, someone who inspires you, someone who's doing what you want to be doing, who opens doors for you, who picks you up when you're down. Raise your hand if you have a mentor and look around. This is impressive. Most rooms, only about 10% of young people raise their hands. If, we, if I leave you with nothing else today, find somebody who will share just an hour of their time with you because it's because of mentors that I'm here today. And my mentors told me that if you're going to enter politics, make sure that you start your day and you end your day thinking about people and working for people. It's not about you, whether they love or hate you. It's what you're doing for them, for their kids and their grandkids. And it's been an amazing year. I just got to travel the whole country and talk to people from all walks of life about how to make democracy better. And everywhere I went, they all thought of you. And they all want you to be more involved in democracy. Something else I'm really proud of is we opened up the Senate appointment process. For the first time in the history of this country, any Canadian who meets the criteria can apply to become a senator and serve their communities in this country. What I'm most proud of, though, is that despite all the ups and downs that exist in any job, especially a job that only a handful of people have had, is every day I wake up and I think about the people of Peterborough Kawartha who sent me here. Every day I come to work and I have the privilege of working with people who are giving up their time with their loved ones, with their families, with their communities to serve you and your kids and your grandkids. And I'm so proud that I have brought around me a really exceptional team of people who care about the things that I care about. And what I'm most excited about, excited about moving forward is tonight at 7 o'clock, I'm doing a Facebook Live with the Huffington Post, and the topic is, they say young people don't care about politics. Well, I beg to differ, so I hope that you will join me at 7 o'clock with Althea Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Now I'd like to pass it on to Jane Philpott. Jane is our Minister of Health, but I know that at her core, no matter what job title she has, she's a family doctor. She spent a long time living and working in West Africa, and even after she moved back home to Canada, she maintained her ties to Africa, helping to open Ethiopia's first training program in family medicine. She cares very deeply about mental health as well, and that's why I've asked her to work on a mental health strategy for the government so we can better take care of one another in Canada. She knows, as I do, that we need to do more to help the wounds that we can't see. Jane. Thank you, Prime Minister. Yep, it's on. Okay. Uh, a show of hands again. I want to know how many of you are considering the possibility of a career in health sciences? Quite a number. Awesome. Great career choice. So I have the health scientist's dream job, to be able to make the kinds of decisions and to be able to advance the country's agenda on health is a tremendous privilege. There are so many things that the Prime Minister has asked me to do, but I, the one that I wanted to highlight to you today is that in the letter that the Prime Minister wrote to me about a year ago now, and he wrote a very similar letter to all of my colleagues, he started off at the beginning of the letter and he said, there is no relationship that's more important to me or to Canadians than our relationship with Indigenous peoples. 
And so that has really been one of the shaping uh, influential factors in my agenda. And within my portfolio falls responsibility for First Nations and Inuit health. And so I have been working very hard along with my colleagues across the country to be able to address the very serious health gaps that exist in this country. The fact that, in fact, if you are Indigenous in this country, you have a life expectancy that is almost a decade shorter than non-Indigenous Canadians. So we have some very serious work to do. One of the specific highlights for me within that portfolio was the fact, was a, a day that I spent in late July on the northern shores of Quebec, on the Ungava Bay, the windswept beautiful coast there, in a, in a little town called Kujuak. And I went to that place because I was there to stand alongside our partners, the leaders of the Inuit uh, communities across this country, when they announced the uh, rollout of a national Inuit suicide prevention strategy. As the Prime Minister has said, mental health issues are some of the most serious issues that we're facing in health in this country, and it's, no, it's seen no greater than Indigenous populations. And I suspect that you, like me, have been very moved by the tragedies that you hear that are occurring across this country. But on that beautiful July day, as the wind blew and I was gathered, surrounded by uh, colleagues, particularly Inuit leaders, and they rolled out this strategy. It was a strategy that was written by Inuit, for Inuit, would be delivered by Inuit leaders across this country and healthcare providers. We were there as partners. We were there to deliver the resources that were needed to say that we want to be partners. It was a very proud moment for me. Despite the difficult circumstances, when we work together, we'll be able to overcome the health challenges that this country faces. And I hope that I get to work with many of you in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Next is Harjit Singh Sajjan. Harj uh, is a former police officer in Vancouver and a Canadian Armed Forces veteran. The, comics, the comic books call him the Minister of Badass, uh, but I call him the Minister of National Defense. Uh, Harj had three deployments to Afghanistan, and because of that, he really gets what our soldiers need on the ground and what we need to do to keep us all safe. So this year, he's been talking to a lot of folks about modernizing our armed forces and has been taking a look at how we can recruit people for the forces that better reflect uh, the diversity and the makeup of Canada, uh, including uh, more women. Harch. Well, thank you very much, Prime Minister. It's, a, it's an absolute privilege uh, to be in this cabinet. Um, the Canadian Armed Forces um, has a, a role to play. And I, if you look at I've pretty much been in a lot of conflict zones. And through those, what I get to see is the absolute travesty that it has on a population. And when I look at all of you, and you look at what's around in Canada, you see opportunity, and you inspire me because of the opportunity and what you have for the future. But you don't see that same sense of opportunity for other folks. So what I'm really proud of is actually when the Prime Minister, some time ago, had the courage to say, that we need to look at the root cause of conflict. Because that's very important to do the right thing. It's not just about going out and fighting at, and, and trying to solve conflict. We need to start looking at the root cause and preventing it in, in the first place. Because at the end of the day, the Canadian Armed Forces, the people who got recruited in, are asked to do some um, tremendous work that has an impact, but has also tremendous toll on them as well. So, my, what really excites me is the peace operations that we're going to be rolling out, I can't say anything more about it just yet, is going to be looking at the root cause of a problem. And not just from a national defense perspective, it's going to be looking at a whole of government perspective of having an impact for the youth that are out there. In Africa right now, 50 to 60 percent of the population in, in most of the countries are 24 years and less. Instead of them being radicalized and going into other groups, why don't we use them as an empowerment? And our approach potentially can do that. I'm very proud to be part of a solution that's going to be looking at the root cause of a conflict and how we're going to help the Canadian Armed Forces to be a tremendous asset around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Harj. And finally, I'd like to introduce you, Amarjeet Sohi. As a Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, Amarjeet works with the provinces and municipalities so that we can build new roads, improve our sewers, I know that doesn't sound important, but trust me, if it breaks, it's important, uh, and helping build public transit systems, which means more buses, subways, and light rail here in Ottawa. He used to drive a bus in Edmonton, so he definitely understands the importance of public transit, 
And because life can't be all about work, I actually found out he once wrote an entire play uh, in Punjabi. So he's uh, more than just a minister. Uh, Amarjeet, tell us about uh, yourself. Well, thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, you for, uh, for being here. I'll tell you, uh, uh, before I go into what I'm really proud of, uh, let me tell you a little bit of myself. I, uh, I came to Canada from India when I was a little bit older than, uh, than you are, and I landed uh, at the Edmonton International Airport on November 21st, the coldest day of my life ever that I, will, uh, that I had ever imagined. Never saw snow before in my life. Uh, uh, and, but I, I came uh, and uh, I did not speak English. I had a very little understanding about the Canadian culture, Canadian values, and Canadian society. And so I struggled a lot during, during school. I faced my share of racism and discrimination, but I was surrounded by wonderful people in the school and wonderful Canadians who gave me the right support to get out of that and, uh, and, and succeed. Then, in, uh, a few years later, I went back to India uh, to uh, work with the social justice uh, a group to help farmers organize and uh, and I was arrested in, uh, in India and spent uh, almost 22 months in, in prison and uh, 19 months of that was in solitary confinement. And uh, I stand here today because there were wonderful people like you who fought for me at that time. People who organized to write letters, people who put pressure on the Canadian government to bring me back. So th through your efforts, the Canadian government brought me back to Canada. So if I stand here in front of today to be part of this wonderful, wonderful team under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the one thing that I'm proud of is being a Canadian. The one thing I'm proud of is serving you to make our country even a better, better place. So that's my pride. I'm so honored to be part of this. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Amarjeet. It's an amazing group of people, and quite frankly, uh, the country deserves nothing less than an amazing, diverse group of people working hard every single day uh, to serve you. Uh, but the fact is, uh, it is a challenge sometimes. Uh, when you're in Ottawa, uh, in the Parliament Hill bubble, which isn't really even Ottawa, uh, it's easy to get wrapped up in uh, what seems important on the floor of the House of Commons uh, or in committee rooms. Uh, and sometimes lose touch with Canadians. And that's why uh, each and every one of us spend as much time as we can out across the country uh, in question and answer sessions, uh, listening to stakeholders and ordinary Canadians, and hearing uh, from them uh, what their questions are, what their concerns are, how we can do better uh, to help to serve uh, to build the right kind of future. So that's uh, where I'm so pleased right now that we get to turn it over uh, to all of you. The eight different schools uh, will get questions, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I think we're starting over on this end somewhere. So introduce yourself and tell us what school you're from. Uh, bonjour. bonjour. Uh, moi, je, je m'appelle Macken Jackson, puis je viens de l'école secondaire publique Luriel. Et um, avant tout, j'aimerais juste vous demander comment allez-vous? Ça va très bien aujourd'hui. C'est bien. Um, et aussi, j'aimerais aussi dire que c'était un grand plaisir d'être ici. Uh, ma question concerne l'immigration. Puis, uh, dernièrement, dans les, années, dans, les, dans les pays développés, comme autant en Europe et en Amérique du Nord, um, on remet en question le bienfait de l'immigration. Puis, um, la semaine dernière, um, le rapport suggère de, um, une augmentation d'assimilés um, de, des immigrants au Canada de 300 000, puis um, afin d'affaiblir, um, de pallier la, la croissance économique du pays. Puis, voici ma question. C'est, um, est-ce que votre gouvernement um, a un plan de mesure qui fait um, pour qu'il y ait une meilleure assimilation sociale et économique pour les nouveaux arrivants? Oui, absolument. Euh, D'abord, l'immigration, c'est quelque chose qui a fait du Canada ce qu'on est aujourd'hui. Le fait qu'on a pu euh, accueillir des gens de partout dans le monde ici a contribué énormément, pas juste à notre succès économique, euh, mais aussi à notre succès euh, social. Nos communautés sont fortes et résilientes 
pas parce qu'elles sont euh, 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 homogènes, mais parce qu'on reconnaît que de la diversité de perspectives, euh, d'histoires, de, d'approches est une grande force. Et euh, ce, ce truc qu'on a développé au fil des années au Canada de voir la diversité comme source de force et non comme source de faiblesse est essentiel. Et d'ailleurs, quand on regarde euh, les défis de la mondialisation euh, et ce qui se passe un peu partout dans le monde avec des migrations, avec euh, des pays qui doivent euh, comprendre comment agir avec plus de diversité, l'exemple le, canadien d'un pays qui se rassemble non, se, non, non, non pas autour d'une identité unique, religieuse, culturelle, historique, ethnique, mais de valeurs partagées qu'on se définit en tant que Canadien par ces valeurs-là, c'est une leçon que nous devons partager avec le monde. Alors oui, l'immigration devient essentielle et on sait que l'immigration va être source euh, d'opportunités pour des gens qui viennent au Canada, mais aussi d'opportunités pour nos communautés, nos, nos économies. Mais on reconnaît aussi que les défis en matière d'immigration euh, sont significatifs. Euh, on se doit d'assurer que les gens vont pouvoir réussir dans notre économie moderne, qui exige plus d'éducation, qui exige euh, des connaissances linguistiques d'une de nos deux langues officielles, euh, qui doivent être euh, aidés à pouvoir s'intégrer dans les communautés de bien des différentes façons. Et c'est pour ça que l'immigration, ce n'est pas juste un enjeu du gouvernement. Un, un, un très bel exemple de ça, c'est euh, la, la, la bienvenue de tant de réfugiés syriens. Oui, le gouvernement a, a facilité, a, 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 a rendu ça possible, mais ça n'a seulement fonctionné parce que, et ça continue, on continue de travailler fort dessus, parce que des communautés, des provinces, des municipalités, des Canadiens, des groupes de Canadiens se sont rassemblés pour les aider à s'intégrer, pour travailler sur les prochaines étapes. Et c'est ça qui est essentiel euh, dans notre système d'immigration, d'accepter de euh, de, de, des gens, mais aussi de s'assurer qu'ils vont pouvoir réussir. Euh, et c'est au cœur de notre approche. Merci pour la question. Prochaine question. Good morning, Prime Minister Trudeau. My name is Julian Ayoub, and this is my cousin, Abdul Ayoub. Uh, we're from St. Matt's High School. Uh, we were Syrian refugees and arrived to Canada two years ago. On, be <laughs> On behalf of our families, Abdullah and I want to personally thank you and thank people of Canada for welcoming us with so much kindness and opportunity. And our question to you is? Although we are safe and secure in Canada, many of our friends and family are still in Syria, where it's very dangerous for them. Can our government do more to protect the people that are still living in Syria and keep them out of danger? Absolutely, we can do more and we must do more. Uh, right now around the world, there are about 60 million displaced persons, people who are, uh, have fled for their homes for, because of conflict, because of war, because of uh, any number of issues. Uh, and that is something that we all have to take care of. And I think there's three ways that we need to think about doing it. First of all, uh, as you are wonderful examples of, Canada can do more uh, to bring people who are living in refugee camps and precarious situations uh, to set up uh, and uh, succeed uh, and you know, build a life here in Canada. Yes, we can do more, and we can encourage other countries to do more around welcoming uh, families fleeing uh, to their countries and give them pathways to success. Secondly, we need to do more to help the immediate uh, proximity countries, the countries that people run to uh, when they're escaping a conflict. In the question of Syria, they go north uh, to Turkey, they went uh, west to Lebanon, they went south uh, to Jordan. Uh, we can do more to support those countries uh, at uh, you know, giving opportunities and a future uh, to young kids and families uh, fleeing for their lives. 
But the third area we can and must do more is actually in the country that is the source of those refugees. We need to work more to establish uh, stability in conflict zones, uh, establish uh, you know, uh, security, uh, and eventually prosperity so people won't have to flee uh, for their lives and will be able uh, to manage it. And I think Canada has an important role to play in all three of those elements and that's certainly something uh, that we're doing. Thank you for your question and thank you for being here, gentlemen. Next. Who's next? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm William Mazur, and I go to Nepean High School. Um, notre question pour vous aujourd'hui, c'est, selon vous, est-ce que vous pensez que la représentation proportionnelle est réaliste et avantageuse pour le pays? Très bonne question. Uh, un des enjeux uh, qu'on avait, uh, qu avait adressé dans notre campagne électorale, qu'on continue d'être préoccupé, uh, c'est le fait que nous avons besoin de faire des réformes à notre système électoral. Nous avons besoin de s'assurer uh, que les perspectives, que les voix des Canadiens sont toujours bien uh, représentées uh, dans le gouvernement et dans notre Parlement, uh, et que les gens au Parlement entendre toute la diversité de points de vue, de préoccupations de tous les Canadiens. Et à, après euh, des, des, des décennies, voire des siècles euh, de notre système actuel, je pense que c'est tout à fait normal euh, qu'on regarde comment on va pouvoir améliorer, réformer notre système électoral. Dans ce système-là, euh, dans, dans cette question-là, il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont énormément de différentes perspectives sur comment améliorer notre système électoral. Et pour moi, au lieu de parler euh, de, euh, de format ou d'éléments de, de, de changement précis qu'on aimerait faire, j'essaie toujours de parler de valeurs. Quelles sont les valeurs sous-jacentes que nous voulons? Euh, quels sont les choix que nous faisons pour avoir la meilleure gouvernance et un meilleur gouvernement euh, et un meilleur processus de bien représenter les citoyens. Il y a des questions et des choix qu'on doit faire. Est-ce qu'on veut que la diversité au Parlement soit entre les différents partis politiques ou est-ce qu'on veut que cette diversité soit à l'intérieur des partis politiques? Est-ce qu'on veut que les gens représentent euh, juste ceux qui ont voté pour eux ou est-ce qu'on veut que les députés représentent à la fois des gens qui ont voté pour eux et des gens qui n'ont pas voté pour eux? Ces genres de questions-là qui ne vont pas directement à quel est le genre de modèle euh, qu'on a de réformer notre, notre processus électoral, mais quelles sont les valeurs qui vont bien servir le Canada euh, pendant les décennies à venir? C'est beaucoup des discussions autour de la réforme électorale. Euh, regarde, OK, qui va être avantagé par ceci ou par cela euh, dans le dernier cycle électoral, dans le prochain cycle électoral? Mais on ne peut pas penser au court terme quand on veut réformer notre système électoral. Il faut penser au long terme. Quel sera l'impact dans 20 ans, dans 30 ans? Euh, et c'est cette responsabilité, cette réflexion-là qui est au cœur du travail que le comité fait, que notre ministre de réforme démocratique euh, fait et euh, qu'on continue à consulter directement euh, euh, avec les Canadiens euh, dessus. Merci pour ta question. Bonjour, Bonjour Monsieur le Premier ministre. Mon nom est Chloé Lafleur élève de l'école secondaire catholique Béatrice Deloge. Ma question est la suivante. Les, les générations plus âgées vous comparent souvent à votre père, M. pierre Elliott Trudeau. J'aimerais connaître votre opinion sur le point suivant. Comment vos idées se ressemblent-elles et comment diffèrent-elles les idées de votre père et de qui viennent vos habiletés de leadership? Mm. Très, très bonne question. Euh, D'abord, il faut que, faut que j'aboue qu'une que des choses qui m'a aidé énormément dans ma vie, ça a été, euh, et surtout dans ma carrière de politicien, euh, ça a été euh, d'avoir eu un premier ministre comme papa. Mais pas dans le sens que vous pensez. Parce que moi, toute ma vie, il y a eu des gens qui connaissaient qui était mon père, qui avaient une opinion déjà faite sur moi. Ils m'aimaient parce qu'ils aimaient mon père, ou ils ne m'aimaient pas parce qu'ils n'aimaient pas mon père. Et 
il, 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 il me regardait avec cet, cet aspect-là. Et j'ai eu à développer un sens très ferme de qui je suis, de qu'est-ce qui sont mes, mes forces à moi, mes faiblesses à moi, et pas être influencé par les perceptions ou les attentes des autres. Alors, pour moi, j'ai appris comment mettre de côté ceux qui me critiquaient sans aucune base, sans me connaître, mais juste parce qu'ils s'attendaient à ce que je sois d'une certaine façon. Mais j'ai aussi eu à mettre de côté les opinions des gens qui trouvaient que je devais être fantastique sans me connaître parce qu'ils trouvaient qu que mon père l'était aussi. Alors, j'ai su développer un sens très concret de qui je suis et comment je suis comme mon père et différent de mon père. Je suis comme mon père dans le sens que j'ai des valeurs et des principes extrêmement fortes. Euh, et euh, la façon que euh, je fais des choix ou qu'on travaille en politique est ancrée dans ces valeurs. Et je suis prêt à prendre des positions très peu populaires si euh, c'est euh, un enjeu qui me tient à cœur. Dans les dernières élections, par exemple, euh, j'ai euh, défendu le fait qu que quelqu'un, un Canadien, euh, qui a été condamné pour le terrorisme, ne devrait pas perdre sa citoyenneté canadienne. Ce n'est pas très populaire comme position, mais sur une, un niveau de, de rigueur intellectuelle, de valeur, c'est essentiel de souligner qu'on n'a pas deux différentes catégories de Canadiens, des Canadiens auxquels on pourrait enlever leur citoyenneté parce qu'ils ont un parent qui a été né ailleurs, ou un Canadien à qui on ne peut pas envoyer, enlever sa citoyenneté parce qu'ils sont ici depuis plusieurs générations. Alors, moi, être ancré dans mes valeurs fortes et précises, euh, ça m'aide énormément à choisir mon chemin en tant que, que chef, respectueux des opinions des autres, euh, mais pas toujours mené par ce qui est populaire ou impopulaire. Mais de l'autre côté, je suis différent de mon père dans le sens que moi, j'ai beaucoup plus passé de temps à être un député de terrain. J'ai dû euh, gagner une, une course à la nomination, à l'investiture euh, dans mon comté de Papineau. Euh, j'ai dû apprendre à travailler euh, au porte-à-porte -porte avec les gens, à écouter les gens. Mon père est arrivé en politique euh, en tant qu'intellectuel avec des idées vraiment déjà euh, assez, assez bien formées par rapport au bilinguisme, par rapport à la Charte des droits, par rapport euh, au multiculturalisme. Et euh, il a amené ces priorités-là. Moi, je passe beaucoup plus de temps en tant qu'enseignant à écouter, à travailler de façon collaborative avec les autres et à respecter euh, cette, cette, cette belle réalité que euh, tout le monde peut avoir euh, des bonnes réponses et pas juste, euh, pas juste le premier ministre. Merci beaucoup pour ta question. Hi, my name is Jade Vermette. And I'm Safi. I am a student at Fillman White High School. My question is, what is the government planning on doing to help support people leaving with challenges gain meaningful employment? Mm. Thank you very much for your question, Sophia. Thank you, Jade. Uh, the fact is, it's really important Uh, for a country like Canada that prides itself on being uh, an open country in which everyone has a real and fair chance to succeed, to look at all the barriers that exist uh, to uh, different people succeeding. Uh, and that's why one of the things that I'm very, very proud of uh, is uh, that we have uh, a minister for sport and for persons with disabilities uh, who's not here today, but Carla Qualtro, uh, who was a Paralympian uh, who uh, won medals uh, in, uh, in the Paralympics uh, in years past and is now uh, tasked with creating an accessibility act, legislation uh, that will govern Canada in terms of ensuring that everyone regardless of their challenges, has fair opportunities to succeed. Uh, not just to succeed for themselves, but to succeed in participating in work and community and mostly contributing, uh, offering what you have to shape the community around you and uh, your world. And that, for me, for a country of 36 million people faced with a, a, a world of 7 billion, uh, the fact is we need to get the very best out of 
every Canadian. And I look forward uh, to bringing forward that Accessibility Act uh, uh, probably by the end of next year because we need to make sure we get it right. And we're doing a lot of consultations. Actually, a couple of days ago, uh, I was with Carla at uh, Carleton University uh, doing a national uh, youth consultation on the issue of uh, disabilities and challenges. Uh, and I'm really, really happy that we're working hard on that to give uh, you and uh, all Canadians uh, every chance they can to contribute and succeed. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, ben, premièrement, bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Uh, je m'appelle Raphaël Gill, je viens de l'école secondaire du Versailles, Gatineau. Uh, ben, premièrement, l'école secondaire et moi tenons à vous remercier de nous accueillir ici. C'est vraiment un privilège. Uh, maintenant, ma question. Uh, à vos yeux, quelle est la place des jeunes de 15 à 17 ans au sein de notre gouvernement? Puis quelle, quelle est une solution envisageable pour uh, nous impliquer dans les enjeux sociopolitiques? Puis comment nous inciter à s'impliquer uh, là-dedans, sachant que nous serons vos prochains électeurs lors des élections de 2019? Absolument. Écoute, pour moi, c'est essentiel d'impliquer les jeunes et, et, et pour plusieurs façons. D'abord, j'ai été enseignant, j'ai été porte-parole en matière de jeunesse euh, toute ma carrière politique euh, pour le Parti libéral. Aller chercher les jeunes et les impliquer et les, les rendre un peu plus intéressés en politique, euh, ce n'est pas juste parce qu'on veut que plus de gens votent, bien, bien qu'on aimerait bien, euh, c'est aussi parce que si un gouvernement ou les politiciens sont en train d'écouter les jeunes sur les grands enjeux qui vous tiennent à cœur, comment vous allez réussir euh, votre vie, vos carrières, comment vous allez pouvoir euh, fonder une famille et commencer euh, dans l'avenir, comment est-ce que vous allez pouvoir euh, avoir un, un, un environnement sain, euh, un monde plus en paix. C'est des grands enjeux qui vous tiennent énormément à cœur. Et si on peut vous amener à participer plus à la politique, la politique va répondre plus à vos préoccupations. Parce qu'un des, un, un des grands mythes autour des jeunes, euh, c'est que les jeunes ne sont pas intéressés par ce qui se passe dans le monde. Au contraire, vous faites partie d'une génération plus intéressée, plus engagée, plus branchée que n'importe quelle génération. Le défi, ce n'est pas de vous faire intéresser par, euh, dans le monde. Le défi, c'est d'être à la hauteur en tant que gouvernement et en tant que politicien pour accueillir, pour écouter, pour vous impliquer dans ces prises de décision. C'est pour ça que euh, j'ai mis sur pied un conseil jeunesse du premier ministre euh, qui amène des jeunes de 16 à, à 24 ans euh, ici à Ottawa pour travailler avec moi sur euh, les grands enjeux, que ce soit euh, des défis euh, auxquels les étudiants font face, que ce soit au niveau de la technologie et de la neutralité de l'Internet, ou que ce soit en matière de, de santé mentale euh, ou euh, d'environnement. De, je veux engager directement plus de jeunes. Mais en plus de ça, euh, on se doit de démontrer dans toutes nos façons de faire euh, que la voix des jeunes, la perspective que vous amenez, est essentielle. Euh, je suis content que Élection Canada, euh, on est en train de, de regarder comment on va pouvoir travailler plus avec les jeunes avant qu'ils deviennent électeurs pour qu'ils développent déjà euh, dans le milieu scolaire l'habitude euh, d'être impliqués au temps des élections parce qu'on a des moments de, de, de vous amener euh, plus proche vers ça, mais aussi d'utiliser les différents moyens technologiques des médias sociaux euh, pour avoir des conversations auxquelles tout le monde peut participer. Vous pouvez devenir membre euh, d'un parti politique à, à partir de 14 ans. Bien, ça, je le sais, pour le Parti libéral, c'est ouvert à partir de 14 ans, puis je pense que c'est équivalent pour les autres partis. On vous encourage de déjà euh, vous impliquer. Comme Bardish a dit, elle a commencé à, à s'impliquer en politique bien avant euh, qu'elle ait le droit de vote. Alors, de comprendre que vos voix, que les enjeux qui vous tiennent à cœur sont importants pour nous, doivent être entendus. Euh, et euh, on attend jusqu'à ce que vous vous impliquiez un peu plus et on sait que nous nous devons euh, de créer des opportunités pour vous impliquer encore plus, euh, on sera sur la bonne voie. Merci pour ta question. Good morning. My name is Rachel Thomas and I represent Corrine Wilson Secondary School in Orleans. Uh, my question is that I understand that you've taken away the tax credit to help families that make less than 50K per year send their children to university with no tuition. But how would you make it more affordable for the families that make over 50K a year 
um, I make over 50K a year with multiple children in university at the same time? That's, that's a great question. Actually, one of the things that we, we did take away uh, was the idea uh, that tax credits uh, help students uh, make it through university. We recognize the cost of tuition, the uh, difficult barriers that are there for post-secondary education, uh, and uh, we know uh, that it is essential not just for you to be able to afford post-secondary education, but it's important for your community and for our country that you be able to get uh, the best and the most education that we can if we're going to succeed. So what we actually realized was tax credits on post-secondary education didn't necessarily go to the students. In many cases they go, because students don't often pay taxes, they go to the parents. And we wanted to be much more direct in our support uh, for students. And that's why uh, the money that we were uh, using for tax credits, we instead put directly towards Canada Student Grants, which means that low-income students uh, getting to uh, university uh, would have uh, $1,000 more every year uh, to help pay the costs of everything from rent to tuition to books uh, to everything. Uh, and middle-income students would also see increased by 50% uh, the direct support we're giving in terms of you know, cash to be able to spend on things that matter when those expenses are coming and not get them back at tax time. So that was a priority, something we could concretely do to give more money uh, to the families that need it and to students who need it uh, get through university in a, uh, and post-secondary education in a much more efficient way. Uh, we also uh, guaranteed that you don't have to start paying back any student loans until you're making a job uh, that pays you more than $25,000 a year. So there's not that drag on you right away when you come out of, uh, of post-secondary education and are just getting your feet, finding your first job, uh, that you have to also uh, deal with paying off your debt when we want you finding the best possible jobs. So those are things we're doing. There's a lot more to do. I absolutely agree with it. And uh, we uh, are certainly working on that as well. But thank you very much for your question. Salut, donc euh, je me présente Karina de la Vallée. Et moi, c'est Amélie Lachansoulard, et nous venons de l'école secondaire catholique Franco-Cité. Donc, la jeunesse franco-ontarienne, appuyée par sa communauté, revendique depuis plusieurs années une université euh, provinciale franco-ontarienne. Donc, le gouvernement de l'Ontario progresse vers une décision finale. Donc, euh, notre question est la suivante. Est-ce que le gouvernement fédéral est prêt à contribuer à l'effort provincial de financement d'une telle université? Aussi, moi et Amélie, on aimerait vous demander si vous avez la chance de prendre une selfie avec nous. <rires> Quand euh, vous avez la chance. Oui. À, à, à la fin de la session, je vais venir vous voir et je vais faire, voir plusieurs étudiants et je vais faire, faire le tour avec vous. Euh, mais euh, par rapport à, 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 à l'identité et la fierté franco-ontarienne, euh, c'est quelque chose que je comprends très, très, très profondément. Je suis, comme vous le savez, fier Montréalais, fier Québécois, euh, mais parce que techniquement, je suis né à Ottawa euh, pendant que mon père était premier ministre. Euh, je suis francophone, né en Ontario, et ça fait de moi un franco-ontarien honoraire, et j'en suis très fier. Euh, euh, mes, mes, mes enfants, d'ailleurs, vont dans, dans une, école, euh, une école publique francophone euh, ici à Ottawa. Euh, donc, pour moi, cette communauté est extrêmement importante. Euh, écoute, on, on est toujours là au gouvernement fédéral pour appuyer euh, les minorités linguistiques officielles à travers le pays. C'est un rôle très important pour, pour mon parti, mais aussi pour le gouvernement euh, canadien. Et je suis toujours prêt à travailler avec euh, les provinces euh, pour euh, renforcer et créer même des institutions qui vont desservir euh, les communautés linguistiques euh, minoritaires euh, officielles parce que euh, c'est important pour euh, l'identité, la, la, la culture et la force de notre pays. Euh, alors, j'ai bien hâte de, de travailler avec mes homologues provinciaux euh, pour euh, voir ce qu'on peut faire pour assurer euh, la force et, et la, la durabilité euh, de ces magnifiques euh, communautés linguistiques minoritaires officielles. Merci beaucoup pour vos questions, en effet. Alors, euh, 
Merci à tous et toutes d'être ici. Euh, C'est pour moi une, une très belle façon de souligner euh, notre premier anniversaire en tant que gouvernement. Euh, mais comme j'ai dit, euh, il y a énormément de travail encore à faire. On a hâte de s'y mettre et on a hâte toujours euh, de vérifier avec vous, d'entendre de, vos questions, euh, d'être de, de, euh, plein partenaire avec vous tous euh, quand vient le moment de bâtir un monde et un Canada meilleur pour tous. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Merci.